Hey fifth grade, how's it going my friends? Welcome back to another day of drama class. So today we are going to continue learning about my absolute favorite playwright and one of the best writers the world has ever known. That would be... You know what, Miss Ruff did not spell it right. How about that? It's not a good start. <laughs> William Shakespeare. The one and only William Shakespeare. Let me move this over a little bit. All right. So, we talked about Shakespeare yesterday, and we talked about the three types of plays that he makes. The first one is a comedy. Remember, comedies are fun, right? They're happy, we laugh a lot. There's usually a character in there called the fool that's supposed to be the subject of everyone's jokes. It's a good time all around. There's also the tragedy. So let me write these down. Comedy. Comedy. Tragedy. Tragedies are the opposite. Tragedies are sad, right? They involve a lot of death, a lot of dreariness, there's a lot of depression, and everyone generally just does not survive. So tragedies are sad. There's also the third one that I really love. That would be history. The histories, the histories are based on, well, history. You have factual events, presented in a fictional matter, right? Some names have been changed of actual characters from history, but the story of their rise and their fall is usually the same, right? Um, so let's move right along. So we talked about 10 interesting facts about Shakespeare. And one of the facts was the kind of paper that Shakespeare used to write and the fact that when he died, his plays were written in something called a folio. And a folio was an early collection of most of his plays all in one book. So they call that an anthology today, or there's even you know a, a collection of books uh, called, no sorry, anthology, encyclopedia is different, my mistake. But a folio, let me write that down. Folio is, collection of Shakespeare's works. All right. So, a collection of Shakespeare's works. The most of his plays were published after his death. They were published, uh, Shakespeare died, write that down. Shakespeare died in 1616, so early in the 17th century. His first, the folio was published, let me write that over here. Folio published. in 1623, right? So there were a few years between when he died and when his plays were published, right? So moving on from that, how did his plays get published? Well, in order to talk about that, we need to talk about a very, very, very special invention that made this happen. There is something known as a printing press. Now, I know most of you guys get news today by reading your iPhones or computers or watching television, but back in the day, back when I was a kid, and even before that, most news was received by reading something called a newspaper. You pick it up, it would have prints all over it, right? You think about papers that you have when stuff gets printed out, right? There are words on a piece of paper. Instead of writing them, 
Many thought there should be an invention that puts words down on the paper. So before printers, there was something known as a printing press. And I'll write that down. Very important. Let me put it. I'm going to erase Shakespeare's death date because we all know that. And I'll keep the folio date up here because this is a different date for us, 1623. The printing press. Printing. There. A very important invention. The printing press was invented by a man named Johannes Gutenberg. All right. I'm going to write that down. Johannes Gutenberg. And he took what was called a wine press and he turned it into a pr printing press. Now we all know wine. Wine is a very fancy drink, right, that adults have. Wine presses were usually used to press grapes so they could use the juice to make wine, right? So the printing press, instead of pressing grapes, the printing press would put metal letters onto sheets of paper, right? They started with letter before ink was able to be written with printers, right? And Gutenberg worked with metal. He was what they call a smith, right? And he made, he used his metal skills to make type. So before even typewriters that you see back in the day, right? He made the printing press and it was able to print letters onto paper. And I know we've talked about how Shakespeare lived a long time ago, right? In the 16th and 17th century. Um, Gutenberg did this in the 15th century. First invented by Gutenberg in the year 1439. That is a very, very, very long time ago. So early to middle of the 15th century. All right. And then... A f another fun fact about the printing press is that most books back in the day, when books were made by hand, writers would use inks that came from water, right? Bef most ink we use today is made from oil. The problem with water is that we all know when water gets wet, it goes through paper, and so the ink did not stick very well. So, I'm going to write that down here. First... Me make sure you guys can see this when I write it. Give me one second here. All right. So the first, first inks made with water. And as you can probably get, like I said, you put water on paper, paper gets wet, paper, uh, you can tear through it way too easily, right? It just doesn't work. So that's why eventually all ink made with oil, right? And that's kind of small, but that's all the, the ink we still use today. Oils don't go through paper. They stick to paper. That's why it's easier to use. That's why we write with it. Pretty simple. All right, moving right along. All right, and the first printing press to be produced on a regular basis, so there's something called mass production, right? When something is successful, we make a lot of it. Kind of like if you have your phones, right? Apple, Samsung, whatever you have. Mass production is when they make a new model, they like it, it's like, okay, let's send it out to stores, so they mass produce it. The first printing press to ever be mass produced because Gutenberg's only worked in a very limited fashion. The first printing press ever invented for mass production was actually made in Mexico. Wait, yes, yes indeed. So in Mexico, in 1534, so let me write this over up top, first big press, Mexico, 
in the year 1534. And Mexico did this before Russia and America. So this was considered a big, big deal. All right. And it says that, um, yep, that's about it. Those are the big, big pieces of information on the printing press. OK, I know it's a lot, friends, and I know it's a little bright. Let me pull the shades. Maybe we can see better. Sorry, one second. See if that helps. Perfect. All right. Sorry about that, friends. Okay, so all this information that I have up here, I will also put on Schoology, just like I did with the 10 facts yesterday. So you may read this at your leisure. This, these are good things to know about the way Shakespeare's plays and scripts were written. But we've talked enough about information with Shakespeare. The whole point of drama class is for us to act. So in order for that to happen, I am going to introduce you to some of Shakespeare's vocabulary words. Like I said, friends, this will all be on Schoology. So don't worry. I am going to post these later on. Very good. So now we have some vocabulary words that we can use. Many, 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 many of Shakespeare's words are still used today. Don't forget, in the fun facts I posted yesterday and we talked about, he was responsible for up to 25,000 new words in his lifetime. That's quite a bit. Many of these words are still used today. Many of them are perhaps a little dated by today's standards, but there were plenty of lines that meant certain things. The three most prominent categories that his words fall under are compliments, insults, and love, and friendship. All right, so we have compliments, we have insults, we have love and friendship. So all three of those are usually what most of his words fall under, the words that he invented. Um, the lines of love and friendship are a little much for your age group. So we are going to leave those for later years. But the compliments and the insults contain some of his best and most used words, both within his plays and some which are used today. So what I am go we are going to do for the rest of the class period is I am going to give you an idea of a couple of his compliments and his insults. Now, the insults, honestly, by today's standards, they're not very insulting. There's actually a lot of fun within all of them. They are fun to say, they are fun to practice. Many of Shakespeare's comedies use the insults to be funny instead of to really truly hurt someone's feelings. So that is something we will see when we pull up the insults. But let's go ahead and start with the compliments. So I will pull those up first. And I will share these with you. I know you can't see them. I'm gonna throw a couple on the board that I like and give you an example of how to speak how to say, rather, the compliments and the insults. But once I finish this, this will all be on Schoology. So don't fret. But anyway, let me pull up some uh, compliments and insults for you, my friends. All right, compliments. Compliments. Compliments are nice things to say. So here are a few of them, right? 
So we've got some fun phrases. I have three columns, right? Three columns, and you will see these when you see them on Schoology. There are three columns of words. We have a, an adverb, right? Or, sorry, we have two adjectives, right? To describe someone, and then we have a noun, right? And we all remember a noun is a person, a place, or a thing. And an adjective is a word that describes the noun. So every compliment and every insult will be a noun that is described by two, count them, two adjectives. So I'll write that down. Compliments and insults. Three, oh boy, that's a terrible number three. It's rough. Write that better. Three words. And they always follow the same structure. We have, let me just make sure you guys can see this. I didn't write it too far. Nope, we're good. Three words. Two adjectives. And one noun. So that is your structure right there. Perfecto. So we have that. Now, let me see here. I'm going to give you an example of some of my favorite lines of compliments. All right. So my first one, and here's the thing. Whenever you tell someone that they are, when you say to someone, you are very nice, right? You are very sweet. Instead of saying you are, back in Shakespeare's time, you would say thou art. So let me write that down. Thou art. Thou art. Just going to get rid of my list here to make sure we can all. Thou art. It means you are. You are. So you are sweet. You are kind. You are something. Doesn't matter. So I will give you an example of some of the compliments and I will write down the words and I will tell you what they mean just to give you an idea. So here is the first set of compliments I have for you, my friends. I will do three compliments and three insults. It seems only fair. So my first one is, thou art a gallant, smooth-faced Welsh cheese. Now you might be thinking to yourselves, ah, boy, is calling somebody after a cheese, is that a, is that a compliment? It was back then. And I will say what that, I'll explain why. So we have a gallant, smooth-faced Welsh cheese. So I will write over here, uh, three words. Gallant. Draw a line right here. Gallant. Smooth. Faced. Welsh. Cheese. Right? Now I will explain what all of those mean. Gallant is a very fancy word for brave. So telling someone that they are brave is always a fantastic compliment to give. So that's a good one. We also have smooth faced. So if someone has a very smooth face, it means they have a very young looking face and they are a very attractive person so always a nice thing to say to somebody and now we come to our most interesting one of all welsh cheese so welsh cheese indeed welsh that first word does any you guys probably have looked at a map if you have a globe or a map at your house or you can easily find one on google take a look at a map of the world there is a place in Europe called the United Kingdom, otherwise known as Britain. Britain, despite what most people think, is split up into four parts. England, which is the main part where London is, the capital and the largest city. Scotland, which is up north. Wales, which is to the west. And Northern Ireland, which is actually on the same island as Ireland, but is part of the United Kingdom. Welsh is the language and dialect that people in Wales speak. 
and their cheeses were known for being very rich and very tasting very good and left a very wonderful full taste in your mouth. So it was a compliment back then to tell someone that they were very much like a rich tasting cheese. I know, strange, but hey, different times, different, different ways of life. So, gallant, smooth-faced Welsh cheese. Now, when you look at these, I did one that was straight across on the list. You will see that when you take a look at this list. If you guys want to practice saying some of these yourselves, you may mix and match from column A. Do, uh, do them in the orders column A, B, and C, but you can take words from different parts of each list to make your own compliment or insult. Sound fair? All right, moving right along. I'm gonna do another compliment. And I'll explain this one to you as well. So we also have one of my favorite ones. Thou art a, let me see here. Let me make sure I have the right one. Thou art a celestial young-eyed valentine. Let me put that one up there. That's a fun one. Celestial young-eyed valentine. Excellent. So, okie doke. So, three words again. We have celestial. Now, when something is celestial, it means it has to do with the stars. So, and the stars are pretty, stars are beautiful. We see them at night, especially if you're out in the country. Plenty of stars in the sky at night. So, if something is celestial, it means it reminds us of the stars. And it's truly wonderful and beautiful. We also have young eyed, right? That's pretty easy. Someone looks very nice. They have young looking eyes, right? They, they just have a twinkle about them. Their eyes are very beautiful and make them look young. And we always want to look young, right? Valentine. Valentine's pretty easy. Valentine, just like Valentine's Day. If someone is your Valentine, you love them maybe secretly or you know them, but informing someone that they are so special to you that they are your Valentine is very nice. So there you go. Three words that work out well. Okie doke. Okay. One last compliment, friends, and then we'll do some insults. Those are the most fun of all. All right. This one. This one has some complicated words, but we will go over them. Okay. We have some big ones here. This one goes as follows. Thou art a flowering, precious, tiger-booted pigeon egg. Well, those are a lot of big words. Don't worry, I'll break them down. First one. Flowering... Precious. Ugh. Flowering. Precious. Sorry, it's kind of small. Flowering, precious. Tiger. Booted. Pigeon. Egg. All right, so here we go, friends. Flowering, precious, tiger-booted pigeon egg, right? So, flowering, precious. Flowering, precious, sounds pre is pretty easy to understand. You are so precious, you're so nice and kind and wonderful that you're almost like flowers growing in a garden. So, hey, good for you. If anybody looks as feels and seems as beautiful and wonderful as flowers, I think you're doing life right. Tiger booted. 
means we have feet like a tiger. Tigers are strong, means our feet are strongly rooted in the ground. And we stand tall and we always know how to carry ourselves and go about our business. Tiger booted. Last one is very fun. Pigeon egg. Now for pigeon egg, pigeons are birds that are usually kind of obnoxious. But if you've ever seen a pigeon lay an egg, pigeon eggs are a bright blue color. So you look as vibrant and as blue and wonderful and bright as a pigeon's egg. All right, there are three compliments. Let's go ahead and do three insults. Now the insults, remember, they're not very hurtful. Like I said, they are mostly fun. So I am going to give you an idea of what some of my favorite ones are. All right, let's start with the first one. Thou art a greasy, evil-eyed hedge pig. That's a fun one. So, greasy, evil-eyed hedge pig. Here we go. Greasy, evil-eyed hedge pig. Perfect. So, greasy, pretty easy, right? Something's greasy, it gets all over your hands, it's gross, it feels gross. So this person is just gross, right? They're full of grease. Evil-eyed, they have an evil look in their eyes and you cannot trust them. Hedge pig. Now, another word for a pig is a hog. So if we get rid of hedge pig, we have hedge hog. And unlike our friend Sonic the Hedgehog from video games, most hedgehogs get very defensive and mean if they think you are getting too close to them. Hedgehogs will roll up into a ball, they will make all the spines on their back go up, so, and they're not very attractive. So if someone doesn't like you, they might say you are a greasy, evil-eyed hedgehog. There you go. All right, that's one insult. Let's move on to some others. All right, moving right along. Let's do another one. So let's see. Thou art a jaded, lily-livered dogfish. All right, jaded, jaded, lily-livered dog. Fish. All right. So we have our first word, jaded, right? Now, if you are jaded, you usually think that you know what's going on, right? You are tired, you are bored, you are uh, lacking enthusiasm, right? Or you also think you are just generally, you generally think you know what you're talking about and you don't. Right? So you don't have a whole lot to offer. So jaded means you're very uninteresting, even though you try to make us think you're interesting. And then we also have, let's see, we have jaded, right? Lily-livered. Lily-livered is one of my favorites. Lily-livered is basically another way of saying you are a coward. You are not as brave as you want people to think you are. You actually aren't brave at all. You are cowardly. So lily-livered. And then last one, dogfish. Dogfishes are actual fish. They are very, very gross. They also have a lot of spikes all over them too, just like hedgehogs. So dogfish are not attractive. So once again, you look like a dogfish. And you are jaded, you are boring, you are uninteresting, you are not as well informed as you come across. And you are lily-livered, you are a coward. So all three of those combine to make one perfect Shakespearean insult. All right, one more. I'm going to go a little over. I apologize. But I think it's worth to do just one last one. So, last but not least. Thou art a rank paper-faced pantaloon. All right. So, rank. If something is rank, 
It means it smells just wretched. Something of the worst smell in the world. Something is rank. It smells terrible. Paper faced. Right? It means you have a thin, terrible face, right? If you are paper faced, then you are just generally don't have a very attractive face. Right? Alright. Okay, yes. So you are very thin, you are very pale, you are not attractive, right? And then pantaloon. Pantaloon sounds like pants. That's because it is. Pantaloons were very big, billowy pants that people of high society would wear that often made them look perhaps a little ridiculous. They were large pants, so they were goofy looking. So why, that's why you say you are a pantaloon. Pantaloon. So that would a rank, paper faced, thin and pale. Pantaloon, you look like billowy, ridiculous pants. All right, my friends. So those are just some examples of compliments and insults. Now, as I said, I will go ahead and put these all on Schoology for you to see. You can experiment with them and have fun and practice at your own desire. And tomorrow, we will go ahead and we will review some scenes. So, stay tuned. All right, fifth grade, I'm sorry I ran over. Thank you, have fun, and I will see you guys on Monday. Sorry, not, I said tomorrow, I meant Monday. We'll do scenes. Awesome. See ya.